Computer-generated zooms into fractals have been around for a few decades, but have you ever seen a real-life fractal zoom? This is a 3D print of a fractal surface. I'll get into precisely what this fractal is later, but first, here's the plan. This square part of the fractal is three times larger than this one here. So I want to zoom the camera into the top of the fractal until it looks the same as it did when we started. Then I can make a looping video that zooms in forever to get a real-life fractal zoom. A few people have done this kind of thing before with real objects. Maybe you've seen this zoom in on some Romanesco broccoli by Polish artist Felix Konczakowski. He also made this loop zooming into a coastline which went viral a few years ago. Of course, there isn't a real coastline that contains a perfect small-scale copy of itself, so this one involves a lot of photo manipulation. I asked Felix how he made his looping animations like this. He tells me that he generally starts with a single photograph and then manipulates it in Adobe After Effects, also using a Droster effect plugin. Speaking of the Droster effect, this is a loop I made with Paul Olivier de Hay and Bart de Smet in 2003, just over 20 years ago. The guy standing next to the picture frame is Hendrik Lenstra, who figured out the mathematics behind Escher's Droster effect print gallery image with Bart the year before. I think that we may have been the first to do this kind of zoom with a real-life photograph. Anyway, back to the broccoli. Maybe you can see a bit of Felix photo manipulation out at the corners of the animation. There's some sort of distortion there. I think this comes from using just a single photograph of the broccoli. Let's see what I can do with just a single photograph of my 3D print. If I scale it down, it just doesn't match up with itself. The perspective is all wrong. To understand what's going on with this, here's a simple 2D sketch that illustrates the problem. Here's a triangle standing in for the fractal. If I put the camera here, it sees a one-dimensional image with the tip of the triangle here and the two bottom corners here and here. Let's make a smaller copy of the triangle. In the fractal, the two triangles should be exactly the same, except that one is three times smaller. But on the screen, the smaller triangle looks like this. Scaling the image up, you can see that it just doesn't look the same. The two bottom corners are different distances away from the tip because the perspective is different. The only way to get the small triangle to look exactly like the big one is to physically move the camera three times closer. So that means that to get my real-life fractal zoom, I cannot do a digital zoom, and I cannot use a zoom lens. I have to physically move the camera closer. That's what this slider mechanism does. I'll start the camera here, then move it three times closer to the fractal. This is pretty far in. In fact, the main reason I'm using this lens on my camera is that it's short enough that it doesn't crash into the fractal with how close I need it to get. The view the camera sees at the end matches up pretty well with the view it had at the start. Let's put this together into a loop, and I'll speed up the movement a bit, and it's not bad. But the stopping and starting isn't great. It would be better if the view kept zooming in the whole time. We can try to fix that by having the slider get up to speed a bit before the start position, then continue on past the end position before stopping. Let's loop that video and again speed the movement up. Again, the fractal matches up okay with itself, but the zoom speed doesn't. This also means that I cannot fade nicely from the end of the video back to the start. To get this to work properly, I need the movement to slow down exponentially. I need to be moving three times slower when I get to the end in comparison to the speed at the start. I'll spare you the details of fighting with the software to get the slider to do this and just show you the result. Now the camera moves in at the correct speed, slowing down as it gets near the 3D print, and I can gradually fade between the close and the far views. So we're in business. There is a bit of irony about this kind of project. The better I do at making this shot as precise as possible, the more that my real-life fractal zoom looks like a computer-generated render. I'm already showing you the view from the second camera, but I can also prove that it's real by messing with the shadows with my hand. Or I can shine this laser level across it. I really like the way the laser slices across the fractal. It starts looking like a space battle from Star Wars. For this zoom, I could have slowed down the movement in post. I could have used my video editing software to get the speeds to match up across the fade. But that wouldn't have worked for this version of the zoom, where the 3D print rotates a quarter turn at the same time that the camera moves in. Here the rotation has to be a constant speed, while the zoom slows down exponentially. Again, the more effort I put into making everything precise, the more it looks like a computer-generated animation, which would, admittedly, have been much easier to make. So of course, let me just say that any imperfections you might have noticed in this video were put there by me deliberately to prove that it's real, not CGI. 
And again, it looks pretty cool with the laser on it. All right, it's long past time that I told you about the fractal. I'll leave the zoom going on in the corner here, partly so that you can see it, and partly to mess with your eyes. The fractal is made recursively. You start with just a square, chop it into a 3x3 three three grid, then raise up the middle square to make a cube. This process replaces one square with a total of 13 smaller squares, five on the cube and a ring of eight around the cube. Now do the same steps to each of these new squares. Chop it into a 3x3 three three grid, raise up the middle square to make a cube, and then repeat again and again and again. I certainly didn't invent this fractal. I'm not sure whether anyone knows who first came up with it, and presumably it has been reinvented multiple times. For the full infinite fractal, you follow the process forever, but for any real-world model, we have to stop at some point. At the last step, we can be more efficient in the number of faces. If we stop here, for example, we can replace each ring of eight squares with four trapezoids. This cuts the number of faces down significantly, which is useful when your 3D printing surface has a limit of a million faces. I also hollowed out the inside with an offset lower resolution version to make it cheaper to print. Fractals are difficult to make with 3D printing. The details can only be so small. I chose this fractal so that the details would be little raised bumps. These can be smaller than other features. I can't go that many steps deep into this fractal curve, for example, because very thin wires will break, or at least get very springy. The slider and rotating mechanisms are made by a company called Edelkrone. They're not sponsoring me, not that that would stop me from complaining about some of the features of their system, but I did manage to get it to do what I want, so I shouldn't complain too much. The system is supposed to be controlled with this web app. You can move the motors with these joystick-style controls, then set key poses. Then you can get it to go between the poses like this. This is great for getting B-roll footage for your product review YouTube videos, but it won't work for me when I need the movement to slow down exponentially. There's no way to do that in the web app, but thankfully Edelkrone supplies an API for finer control than just moving between waypoints. I'll spare you the details, but I had to write my own feedback control system to get it to roughly do what I want. I get machine precision in my 3D print, and I get machine precision in the slider and rotating motors, but the interface between those two things is me lining things up by hand. There were a lot of things I needed to get right. The fractal must rotate precisely around its tip, the camera must point precisely in the direction that the slider moves, and it must also point precisely at the tip of the fractal. I also need to know precisely where the near and far camera positions are along the slider. To work all of this out, I used a feed from the camera going into the streaming software OBS. With this, I can take a screenshot with the camera in one position and overlay it on top of the real-time view as I move it to another position. When the views don't quite match up, the way in which they don't match up tells me, after some thought, what I need to adjust to get them to match better. It doesn't hurt that the camera goes a bit out of focus when we get close to the fractal. The blurriness hides some of the inaccuracies. Even with all of that, I still found that I could make some of the loops match a little better with a tiny bit of rotation and scaling in post. This was not my first attempt to get footage for this video. Can you see the problem I had with this setup? Well, yes, I discovered hours into one recording session that the reason it was so hard to line things up was that the weight of the camera flexed the rod holding up the slider. In the final setup I used, I switched to this two-point support system using this, the cutest clamp of all time. All right, finally, here's one more loop with the laser. If we point the laser line across the top of the fractal, then it matches up with itself when we go around the loop, and so now we can have the laser on all of the time as we do our real-life fractal zoom. As always, thanks for watching.